Without question, Savicevic is the player with whom I had the most rows. He hardly trained, he hardly worked, and when he was on the pitch, everybody else had to work twice as hard to make up for him. But he was an exceptional talent, and we turned him into a superstar. Yes, I had issues with him. He was a fiery character who felt he had to play. For me, personally, it got to the point where I lost the will to coach. He really was a genius, when he felt like playing that is. The problem is, he frequently didn't feel like playing, but the things he did and the moves he pulled off are a thing of beauty, truly unbelievable stuff, kind of like what Messi is doing today, only with even more flair and style. Dejan Savicevic was born on the 15th of September 1966 in Titograd, Montenegro, which at the time was one of the six countries which formed the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. It is known today as Podgorica, the capital of Montenegro. He got into football at a young age and had a unique education in the sport which was vital in developing him into the maestro that he would become. As a young he played with his mates on uneven and unforgiving surfaces, something which he claimed would give him an advantage over his peers as he said in an interview. Unlike the children who played in the city's well-organized stadiums and playgrounds, I had to take care of every nuance. I learned to listen to the ball, to feel it, to predict in advance where it would go. I learned all the tricks, all the important dribbles on the street. As a teenager, he began to play in futsal tournaments against grown men two or three times his age. The usual benefits of futsal such as improving first touch, developing confidence in one-on-ones and increasing reaction times are well known and have been harnessed by many South American nations. There were many additional advantages to the young Dejan being exposed to it in a harsh and tough environment without refs. Again he recalls, they treat you like a child, which is extremely insulting at that age. Well, then you're looking to impose yourself. The street hardens you, teaches you to fight back, helps you to understand that you win over the team and the audience, not only with your gift and talent, but also with your impudence, a touch of impudence. The most important lesson I learned playing street football was that if I show weakness and insecurity on the field, I will cause the opponent to step on me. That's why I never gave up. I start and if I don't succeed once, I continue a second, a third time, until I do. At the age of 15, he joined local club Mlados in 1981. He stayed with them for a couple of years until he joined Budignos Titograd in 1983. At the age of 17, he fortuitously got handed his first start for the first team in a huge match against favourites Red Star Belgrade. In front of a packed home crowd, a delirious Savicevic scored what would be the only goal in the 81st minute to hand his team a famous victory. His first two full seasons saw him emerge as one of Yugoslavia's brightest attacking talents. The 86-87 season saw a sharp upturn in the club's fortunes following the arrival of new head coach Milan Zivadinovic. He installed Savicevic as the main attacking focal point and he was so effective there that the youngster would be voted as the breakthrough talent of the season. He also made his debut for the Yugoslavia national team, coming on as a substitute to score the third in a rout of Turkey. His final year with Budik Nos was notable for two main reasons. Firstly, because it saw him clash with another manager, this time national team head coach Avicja Osim. Savicevic was furious at his lack of playing time under Osim and unleashed a stunning tirade against him in national magazine Duga, saying, Osim doesn't appreciate my skills and even declares so publicly. Well, I'm not going to sit here and take that. I've got no respect for him as a coach, neither on the club nor the national level. For me, it seems that the similarly hot-headed creative talent Eric Cantona took great inspiration from this, as he would call French national team coach Henri Michel a sack of shit on national telly a year later. Secondly, the season was consumed with talk of who Savicevic would be playing for the following year. Yugoslav Giants Red Star, Partizan Belgrade and Hadruk Split all tabled offers for the attacking midfielder. There was huge pressure from some pretty important and powerful people for him to move to Partizan, but in the end, the lure of showcasing his skills in the European Cup proved too powerful and he signed for Red Star on 20th of June 1998. He was immediately called up to serve a year in the Yugoslav People's Army. He was staged in the Skopje barracks with an agreement that he would be released for Red Star's European fixtures and international games. And it was in this setup that Savicevic made his debut for his new club, coming on just after half time and scoring in the second leg of the 8 0 aggregate route of Dundalk. Savicevic was shocked when his manager Branko Stankovic informed him that he would be starting on the left wing in the place of Mitar Merkola for the round of 16 first leg against AC Milan. Despite severely lacking in match fitness, he played well 
Miguel in a tough 1-1 draw at the San Siro. That match had definitely boosted his preparedness and he again started the return leg, assisting Dragan Stojkovic's equaliser just 4 minutes after Marco Van Basten had given the Rosanieri the lead. The match went to penalties and Savicevic was one of two Red Star players to miss their spot kicks as Milan advanced to the quarters. Savicevic was allowed to serve the rest of his time in the military in the Belgrade barracks as part of a so-called sporting company which was created to allow the star Yugoslav players to keep up with their training and development. His time at Red Star really began in 1989 and that season his 17 goals and 38 appearances in all competitions helped the team to a league and cup double. He was called up to the national team squad for Italia 90. Savicevic was anonymous in the opener against Germany as were many of his teammates and they were smashed 4-1 courtesy of a powerful Lothar Mateus performance. He was dropped for the remaining two group stage fixtures and used as a second half substitute in the last 16 match versus Spain as Dragan Stojkovic inspired his team to a 2-1 victory after a late flurry of activity culminating in a beautiful free kick. Savicevic started on the bench once more for the quarters against Argentina. Yugoslavia were reduced to 10 men after 30 minutes. Dejan was called for again in the second half and he brought some energy to the Yugoslav attacks. However, he didn't have his shooting boots on and missed a whole host of great chances, the biggest sitter being an extra time where he blasted over from 5 meters. Yugoslavia lost on penalties. It was the following season though that will forever go down in history. Zervena Svezda had an exciting attack minded team and almost all positions were very comfortable with the ball at their feet. They boasted some hugely talented young players like Robert Prosnetsky, Vladimir Jugovic and Darko Panchev who had signed for the club on the same day as Dejan. But Savicevic was arguably the pick of the bunch. A classic number 10, he was a lefty who was also reasonably comfortable with his right. This meant he could attack down the left where he would look to swing in across or down the right where he could cut in and let off a shot with his dangerous left. He was blessed with exceptional vision and was a wonderful patter of the ball, making him a proficient assister and someone who provided some mind-blowingly stunning key passes in his career. Although not shy of having a crack at goal by any means and capable of scoring some other worldies, this was not what he was obsessed with when on the pitch. He was addicted to dribbling and a lifelong disciple of what he considered the purest expression of football. As he poetically explains, dribbling is the masculine principle, power. He is the greatest charm of this fantastic sport. Dribbling is the means by which you break down the opponent's defence, the way you show him that you are stronger. That's where you can see the mastery. It was important for me to establish a relationship with the opponent, to see how he reacts. It means that I respect him. So, in my opinion, in dribbling is the enjoyment, the passion, the joy of the game. He had brilliant close control, bags of confidence, flair, an explosive turn of place and an air of unpredictability which made his dribbling so intoxicating and exhilarating to watch. Driven forward by an inspired Savicevic, Red Star embarked on a European Cup journey which is the stuff of legend. He wasn't at his best in the first round fixtures against Grasshoppers and didn't feature in the round of 16 victory over Rangers, but he burst into life from that point onwards. In the quarterfinal first leg against Dynamo Dresden, he was looking very dangerous and assisted Dragisa Binic to score his team's second with a lovely lofted pass. Less than 10 minutes later and he was on the score sheet himself, netting Red Star's third with a fizzing low angled drive. He was once more in menacing mood for the second leg in Germany and not long into the second half he took Mathers firmly into his own hands, bulldozing his way through half of the Dresden team with a heady combination of brute force, determination and dribbling skill to score a wonderful solo goal, without a doubt one of the best in his career. Advancing to the semis with a 6-0 aggregate win they would face off against the might and pedigree of Bayern Munich. The first leg in Munich was tough as they went 1-0 down after 25 minutes. Savicevic was in one of those moods though and was pulling the strings trying to make things happen. Darko Panchev equalised on the stroke of half time before the Macedonian striker combined with Savicevic who tore away from defenders and lashed a low one pass Aumann to put Red Star 2-1 up in the 70th minute. <laughs> The second leg in Belgrade got off to a dream start and passage through to the final looked assured when Mikhailovic smashed home a free kick which had been won after Savicevic had been brought down following one of his trademark dribbles. Red Star had a 3-1 aggregate lead and were playing some beautiful stuff. 
it all fell apart in four disastrous second half minutes. In the 62nd minute, Brian Laudrup was brought down outside the area. A terrible howler from keeper and captain Stojanovic saw the resulting free kick spin out of his hands and through his legs. Game on. Four minutes later and Manfred Bender punished some confusion in the box to level the tie on aggregate. As both teams had scored two away goals, it would be heading to extra time if the score stayed the same. And it looked for all the world that that would be the case when, in the 90th minute, Klaus Augenthaler failed to deal with Mikhailovic's driven cross, shanked it towards goal where Aumann flapped at it and the ball floated in. There was delirious scenes of jubilation in Belgrade as Red Star had made it through to the Champions League final for the first time in their history. Although Serbena Svezda had won the league, they were beaten 1-0 by Hadrick Split a week before the Champions League final courtesy of an Alan Boxic strike, meaning that an unprecedented treble was no longer attainable. Their opponents in Bari were a star-studded Marseille side boasting the likes of Basil Bolli, Jean-Pierre Papin, Chris Waddle, Aberi Pelli and Dragan Stojkovic. Marseille dominated possession in the match and created by far the most and the best chances of the game, the best of which fell to Papin and Waddle. Red Star defended well and posed their own threat on the counter-attack, especially when they built through Savicevic. But clear sights of goal were few and far between. Savicevic was taken off on the 85th minute. The deadlock could not be broken after 90 minutes and it went to extra time, which devolved into a physical and scrappy war of attrition. Marseille had the best chance to seal victory once more, but again could not take it. In the resultant penalty shootout, Manuel Amoros was the first up for the French giants after Poznetsky had buried Red Stars first. Amoros missed, which would prove to be decisive as every other player put their spot kicks away. Red Star have won the Champions League and it still remains one of the greatest shocks and biggest underdog fairy tales in the competition's history. Savicevic and a few of his colleagues have been elevated to the level of global superstars. In August, Red Star won the Intercontinental Cup, beating Chilean club Colo Colo 3-0 in the final, a match in which Savicevic would assist Djukovic for the opener with an inch-perfect slide rule pass before being sent off in the 43rd minute for lashing out in an off-the-ball incident. His growing status in the game was rocketed to the stratosphere after Servena Svezda faced off against Man United in the European Super Cup in November. A half-empty Old Trafford summed up the lack of respect shown to the European champions by the fans. I'm sure many were regretting their decision to stay home after though, as the 20,000 or so fans in the stadium were treated to a Savicevic masterclass. The match got off to a terrible start as Red Star conceded a harsh penalty for what I think was handball after after only five minutes. Milojevic saved Steve Bruce's spot kick and this really seemed to galvanize the team and Savicevic in particular. He was unplayable and ran rings around the United midfield, giving Paul Ince an especially torrid time as he failed to deal with the inspired Montenegrin. The profligacy of Savicevic and his teammates meant they were unable to capitalize on their dominance and United would win 1-0. Sir Alex was the first to admit after the match that they were annihilated and a spectator is on record as saying that Savicevic's dazzling display was the finest individual performance they had ever seen. Savicevic himself rates it as his best ever match. A month later and Savicevic came second in the Ballon d'Or, tied on points with Panchev and some way behind Jean-Pierre Papin. Now, I won't go as far as to call it a robbery. Papin is one of my favourite strikers ever and he had had a magnificent season, scoring 36 goals. But Savicevic had been the spark of inspiration which took Red Star to the level needed to win the Champions League league, beating Papin's Marseille in the process. He probably deserved it in hindsight. That season, the European champions had to play their Champions League home matches in Bulgaria due to the rapidly worsening situation in Yugoslavia. Following declarations of independence from Croatia, Slovenia and Macedonia in 1991 and Bosnia in 1992, harrowing and brutal wars broke out which would last for years. Savicevic helped Red Star to win their third consecutive league title in what would be the last ever season of the Yugoslav First League. Before joining joining AC Milan for £5 million in the summer of 1992. Milan had been under the ownership of Silvio Berlusconi for six years when Savicevic arrived. Same window that Savicevic arrived, Berlusconi had broken the world transfer record twice. First on Jean-Pierre Papin for £10 million from Marseille, then on Gigi Lentini from Torino for £13 million. Zvonimir Boban also arrived that window. AC Milan already boasted some frightening attacking talent in the form of Ruud Hullet, Marco Van Basten, Daniele Massaro and 
Marco Simeone. This is before we even mentioned the strict Serie A rules at the time regarding overseas players. Teams were only allowed three foreigners in any matchday squad, with Rijkaard, Hulit, Boban, Van Basten, Papan and Savicevic, Milan had a total of six in their squad. Add this to the fact that AC were managed by the extremely negative and defensively focused Fabio Capello who valued hard work and running over creativity and flair, then it becomes clear why Savicevic hardly saw any game time at all that first season. But Berlusconi loved Savicevic, having been enthralled watching him play on television and just knew he had to bring him to Milan. He was given his debut in the Coppa Italia against Ternana in August. He made a brilliant first impression, scoring twice and assisting one in a 4-0 drubbing. His league debut came on match day 2 against Pescara. It was an absolutely bonkers game which Milan won 5-4, with the highlight being Savicevic's sumptuous cross for Van Basten's outrageous overhead kick. Despite this good start, Dejan was not favoured by Capello and didn't really fit into his system. The Italian manager preferred the industry of Albertini and Aranio rather than the elite technical skills of Savicevic. In Capello's words, he played the Yugoslavian style. He was the star and the others had to run for him. He was generally less than spectacular when he did get a look in, down in part to Capello shoehorning him in the team on the right wing, far from his most effective starting position. Such was Savicevic's disappointment in the situation in Milan that he was on the verge of leaving in January with offers tabled from Marseille and Atletico Madrid. These fell through and he went on to make 10 league appearances, scoring 4 and assisting 4 as AC won the Scudetto. There were several important developments with regards to the playing staff before the 93-94 season. Ruud Hullet went to Sampdoria and Frank Rijkaard returned to Ajax. Marco Van Basten took what was expected to be a short break to recover from an ankle injury which turned out to be career ending. All of this led to less competition for playing time in the attacking third. This meant that Boban, Papan and Berlusconi's favourite Savicevic were the three preferred foreign players due to having been with the club for a year. Winger Brian Laudrup and striker Florin Radociu arrived in the summer window, but similarly to Savicevic in his first season, they would struggle for regular game time. After starting both the Super Cup against Torino and the Serie A curtain raiser against Lecce, it did indeed seem like Savicevic was about to get a run in the team. He was subbed off for Donadoni around the hour mark in both these games, and this turned out to be a warning sign for Capello, who dropped Savicevic from the matchday squad in favour of Donadoni and Dejan didn't get a look in for 5 league games in a row. The frustrated and outspoken Savicevic vented his anger in the press, publicly slamming Capello in a newspaper interview. This led to an expletive laden trading ground bust up. More clashes were to come, as Savicevic continued to struggle for game time under the Italian, culminating in his refusal to travel to Anderlecht for a Champions League match after being named among the reserves. A furious Savicevic ended up leaving the training ground and driving to Switzerland to calm down. The press caught wind of this scandal and chaos ensued, and there was even calls to sack the belligerent playmaker as no one in Milan's history had ever refused to travel with the squad before. Savicevic knew that Berlusconi would always have his back and nothing more serious came of it. Savicevic would be subject to further disrespect as he was not taken to Tokyo for the final of the Intercontinental Cup against Sao Paulo, a match which they would lose 3-2. In an interview Years later, Capello conceded he may have made a mistake. I decided to play with the lineup that was already planned. Savicevic's quality might have changed the fate of that match. In fact, after these incidents, he received seven straight starts in the league. Capello was playing an ultra defensive 4 4 2 system, which saw Savicevic frequently played out of position on the left, the right, or even up front on occasions. Despite this, the flair of the brilliant Montenegrin still flickered and appeared in moments of inspiration. These bursts of brilliance led to journalist Germano Bovalenta dubbing him Il Genio or the genius in La Gazzetta dello Sport. Bovalenta had to endure some ridicule from his colleagues who were not as convinced with Savicevic as he was. So negative minded were Capello's Milan that season as they won the Scudetto having scored only 36 goals, just one more than 17th place Atalanta did. As boring as it was to watch and no doubt to play in, it worked as they had the best backlining in the country, letting in only 15 that whole season. Savicevic himself managed 20 appearances in the league but failed to score a single goal. After the Anderlecht incident, Capello began to utilise Savicevic more in Europe and Il Genio repaid him with some excellent creative performances in the group stages, assisting three in one match against Porto and scoring twice home and away against Wolfsburg. He was awarded with a start in the one-legged semi-final against Monaco, a match which saw Savicevic face off against another outstanding number 10 of that era, Enzo Schifo. It was the Montenegrin playmaker who came out on top, helping his side to a 3-0 victory. In the climax of the
the competition, they would face Johan Cruyff's Barcelona, featuring the likes of Hristo Stoichkov, Romario, Ronald Coleman and Pep Guardiola, a squad so brilliant that they were dubbed the Dream Team. In the pre-match war of words, Cruyff promised to give AC a lesson in attacking football that would set the standard for the rest of the world. Capello said he was looking for an ugly Milan. Everyone really was expecting Cruyff's men to dish out a pasting to the Rosanieri. Their first choice central defensive pairing of Baresi and Costa Curta was suspended, leading Capello to have to cobble together a makeshift backline, moving Maldini into the centre alongside inexperienced youngster Filippo Galli. Savicevic recalls Berlusconi's words of support to his team. Before that trip to Athens in 1994, Berlusconi visited us. He gave an appropriate speech, wished us a happy trip, a good game. He was already heading for the exit, and then he suddenly turned and addressed me in an almost solemn tone. If you're a genius, show yourself tomorrow. All the players, the coach, the journalists heard and saw that. And my god if those words didn't set a fire in Savicevic's belly. El Genio played like a man possessed as Milan subverted all expectations, threw off the shackles of their conservative low-scoring Serie A campaign to serve up a feast of fearless offensive footy. The improvised defence turned out to be an unintentional masterstroke as they, along with the immense Marcel Desailly, stopped Barca from playing the way they wanted, winning every tackle, and Savicevic quickly made it clear that he was feeling it, and so his teammates supplied him whenever they could. This took only 20 minutes to bear fruit, as he skipped past Nadal, drove towards goal and scooped the ball into the path of Massaro, who passed it into an empty net. The Milan dominance continued, and Massaro got his and the team second after some great work from Donadoni. Not even a minute after the restart, and Savicevic scored one of the all-time great Champions League final goals. Pouncing on Nadal's indecision, he saw the keeper off his line and guided in a delicious lob from an audacious angle, a jubilant Savicevic ran to the crowd. Cruyff looked shell-shocked as his game plan was being decimated by the genius from Titograd. He came so close to grabbing his second, but saw his shot hit the post. But not to worry, Desai picked up the pieces of that move to compound the Blaugrana's misery and make it 4-0. This thumping at the hands of the Rosanieri remains one of the most embarrassing results in Barcelona's history and one of the most impressive in AC Milan's. They have become champions of Europe in the most emphatic fashion possible and, after his virtuoso performance, no one would ever doubt that Savicevic truly deserved the moniker Il Genio. For my money, it is one of the greatest individual performances the Champions League final has ever seen. New AC legend Dayan was pretty much untouchable in the eyes of the board, so much so that chairman and CEO Adriano Galliani even contacted Savicevic during his vacation to ask his opinions on the club's plans to sign David Ginola and Faustino Asprilla. Il Genio voiced his disgust at the idea, even threatening to request a transfer if they went ahead with it. Needless to say, neither player was signed. Berlusconi and the board had no right to pick the team however, and Capello continued to use Savicevic sparingly, as he made only 19 league appearances, scoring a personal best 9. A tally which included 4 in a single game against Barry. He also assisted 9 as well in a superb individual campaign. Although the Rosanieri were disappointing in the Serie A, finishing 4th, 13 points behind winners Juventus. His assist for Massaro helped his team beat Arsenal 2-0 in the European Super Cup. This time, he was actually taken to the Intercontinental Cup final but wasn't able to help his team avoid defeat to Vélez Sarsfield. Capello again called upon his superstar forward to provide some magic in the knockout stages of the Champions League and Savicevic duly obliged. He once more saved his best for the most high pressure match, the semi-final against PSG. He assisted Boban's dramatic late equaliser as Milan executed a devastated counter-attack in the 90th minute of the first leg. In the second leg of the San Siro, he was once more at the top of his game when it mattered the most, as he scored two to set up a final with Ajax. In a devastating blow to the player, the manager and his team, Savicevic failed a fitness test and was not available for selection in the final. I think this clearly changed how Capello decided to approach things, as I believe he would have gone for a more attacking formation and strategy like he did against Barca the previous year had Il Genio been available. As it was, the Rosanieri put on a trademark Capello defensive display and were undone by a late moment of magic from an 18 year 
16-year-old Patrick Kluivert. Despite the arrivals of Roberto Baggio and George Weah in the summer, Savicevic actually got given his most appearances ever in the league for AC Milan in the 95-96 season, 23, as his team reclaimed the Scudetto. This would be the third and final Serie A triumph of his time in Milan. His personal highlights from that season include scoring his first ever goal in the Derby della Madonnina to rescue a draw against Inter. The 3-1 victory over Roma in February saw him provide one of the best assists of his career, finishing off a slaloming and explosive assault on the right flank with an inch-perfect cutback to Panucci. In the 3-0 defeat of Parma, everything that was so good about his dribbling was on display, as he repeatedly skipped past his opponents like they weren't there, assisting Baggio and Donadoni before getting on the score sheet himself. He ended the season with 6 goals and 9 assists. He would spend 2 more campaigns with Milan before returning to Red Star in 1998. He left AC Milan as a legend, a Hall of Famer who had left an unforgettable mark on the city. He scored 34 and assisted 52 in 144 matches in all competitions. He was given the captain's armband in Belgrade, but the country was embroiled in a war with Kosovo and were subjected to a campaign of NATO airstrikes, meaning that football naturally took a back seat and the league was abandoned early. Savicevic had made only three appearances. He moved to Rapid Vienna, where he enjoyed something of a career renaissance, scoring 20 goals across two seasons before retiring in 2001 at the age of 35. Dejan Savicevic is, I think, what we would refer to nowadays as a luxury player. From his hatred of trainings, early mornings, and his fiery relationships with almost every manager he played under, to his reluctance to track back and run, he was an inconsistent and frequently grumpy player who was accused of going missing against smaller teams, of being virtually invisible for the majority of some matches, until he showed up with something breathtaking. Because isn't that the nature of genius? Talent hits a target that no one else can hit. Genius hits a target that no one else can see. Talent is a flame. Genius is a fire. There is no great genius without some touches of madness. And if I was a manager, the genius of Savicevic would have been a luxury that I indulged in every time, especially if I had players like Marcel Desai picking up the slack.